All right, let's get started. We're going to go over chapter six today. So during the first part of the period, I'm going to go over what's in the book. And then we're going to look at an example and try to do an example sort of as a class. During the second part, you will have, as I have been doing, I'll give you a problem to try for the first part of the class on Wednesday. Then I'll go over that problem the second part of the class. Hopefully now everybody knows there is no class next week. It's spring break. All right, and then two weeks from now, you will have break, you will have a lab, I should say, to work on the homework assignment for chapter six. All right, and if you do the math, then after that, will be seven in a lab, eight in a lab, nine, but the lab for nine we're gonna do as a class because I'm gonna show you how to create stuff GUI in Eclipse. All right, you won't even have to turn that in, but just so you get some practice doing that. We'll do a couple projects GUIized, so to speak. All right, so I'm not sure exactly what page this is, but it's beginning of chapter six. It's a first look at classes. So what this chapter does is it starts to change a little bit. And what I mean by that is previously with the stuff that we did, you were using Java just like you'd use any other language, all right? You weren't exactly even using it totally in an object-oriented way. That, that changes starting with this chapter, all right? Because as you can see, we talk about objects and classes. What they have you do throughout the chapter is they have you write a simple class. It's a very simple rectangle class that has a width and a height and an area, all right? Basically, that's just about it, just so you can start getting used to that, all right? They'll talk about instance fields and methods, constructors, passing objects as arguments. Everything we passed so far, if you've ever written a method and passed anything into the method, everything that you've done so far, you've been using the primitive data types, those eight simple data types. You know what they are, all right? Now we're talking about objects. The difference is when you pass an object, when you pass an object into uh, a method, you're passing what's known as the address of that object. Since you're passing the address in, any change you make to the object in the method is a permanent change, all right? So, you know, you heard me use the term earlier when we were talking about primitive values of pass by value. This is called pass by reference, all right? We'll look at that. We'll also go into overloading methods and constructors, okay? Talk a little bit more about scope. Those of you who've always wondered about the package statement and some of these imports and some of the stuff that we've done, like with public and private, that will be addressed in this chapter. All right? The stuff that's on the end, this focus on object-oriented, finding the classes, responsibilities, etc. If we have time, we'll go through that, but I'm not that concerned that we go through that part. All right? Now, I, I don't want to sit there and give you this long to-do I may have done it, you may have heard it from me, you may have heard it from Denny, you may have heard it from Jim Schmidt last semester, but let's just keep this real simple, all right? If I was going to create a class, what you're doing in object-oriented programming more than anything else is you're modeling. And if I was going to create a class that I was going to call person, all right, the person would have all the properties I decided to give him or her, all right? Such as, for example, I might give them a height, I might give them a weight, I might give them a gender, etc. But they only have those properties that I give them. All right? In much the same way, they only have those methods or behaviors that I give them. So if I give them a method called eat and another one called drink, they can eat and they can drink. All right? Well, what about this? They can only do what I give them the ability to do. All right? But when I'm trying to create a blueprint, for what I want all persons to look like, that's a class. Every time I create a person object, which is also called instantiating or instancing, then I'm creating a person instance. So I could create a class and then create a bunch of objects based on that class. That's what we're going to do at the end of the chapter here. All right. So they give you a bunch of stuff, but I, I don't know if there's any more that's in there than I, you know, I think I basically hit you with a high point so far. All right. So they mention here, it says, so far, 
the objects that you've used in your programs have come from classes in Java API. In other words, other than the class that you've created that has, whole, ha, that has held main, everything else that you've done, you've used built-in stuff. You haven't created any of your own stuff. You're going to be creating more of your own stuff as we go on in here. So the author mentions, you, you, you've used things already. You've already used the scanner class. You've used the random number class. You've used the file I.O. class. So you've used these things already. So you have been using them. You may or may not have noticed this, but when you look at these lines here up on the screen, line 17 and line 19 and line 23, in each one of those, in each one of those three lines, you're creating a new object. And each one of those objects, keyboard and RAND and output file, must be a type of a class. So keyboard is a type of scanner, RAND is a type of random, out fi output file is a type of print writer. Okay, so the syntax for this is the name of the class, the object, equals new, and here's where we're creating a new instance of the class. And if that confuses you, you're going to see it, and you're going to keep seeing it for the rest of this semester and all of next semester. All right. So what the author is saying is you've already used a bunch of built-in classes. Okay. And then he explains this, but again, it's pretty much what I just said. Now, then he starts to get into primitive variables versus objects. A primitive variable can only hold one value at a time. It's a simple variable. S primitive variables are also known as elementary variables. All right? Objects can conceivably hold more than one thing at a time. If I create a person object and I say that that person has a height, they have a weight, and they have a gender, that's three things that one object is holding, all right? And when we get into the next chapter, into chapter seven, we'll talk about another type of object, and that's the array and the array list object, all right, in the next chapter. Now, it gets a little bit confusing, but what you have to realize is what happens when you do something like this, when you say int whole number or double real number or whatever, what happens, since those are both primitive data types, is somewhere in the memory of the, of the computer, either four bytes for an int or eight bytes for a double, they get allocated, and it's going to hold some kind of a value, all right? But it's going to be a simple value. The actual value is held in there. On the other hand, so you know, it might have 99, 123.45, etc. but the difference is, when you create an object, the object isn't held in that area in memory. Rather, the address of where that object lives is held there. All right? You may have heard this, and you may have heard me say it or other people, but um, there used to be a game that was on television many years ago. It was called something like Treasure Island. And what it was was people would come out, and what they would do is they, they would be look around a city or whatever for different things, but they were clues, all right? And the thing is, when they found a clue, it would tell them where the next clue was. And eventually, when they put all the clues together, they could find the prize, all right? Well, the reason I'm telling you that is when you look at as, as finding something and finding a clue, and it tells you where something is, that's kind of what's happening with an object, all right? It's holding an address. And when you start to think of address, all right, start to think of basically permanence. And if that confuses you, it really shouldn't. Because again, the address of this place is 6004 South County Road G. If for some reason Blackhawk moved out of here tomorrow and someone else moved in, the address wouldn't change. Just the occupants at that address would change. That's the thing about when you start working with objects. The, those addresses, computer addresses don't change. It's just what is held or pointed to by those addresses that can change over time. And they start to get into this here. I don't know, he, he's got his metaphor with a kite and a string. I don't even know what the hell he's talking about. So He comes in and starts talking then about, let's write our own class. Okay? And he says, let's keep it real simple. 
So let's create a class that's called rectangle. And for right now, for right now, this rectangle class will have just a couple different methods. Okay, it'll have two different um, pieces of data, a length and a width. And it'll have two different methods, one that says set length, one that calls that says set width. Later when we go on, you'll notice not only will you have methods that start with set, you'll have methods that start with get. I mentioned this to you earlier in the semester, you may or may not remember. Anything that starts with set like that, like you see at the bottom of the screen, those are known as mutators. Anything that starts with get, those are known as accessors. So get methods are like those of you and most of you in here, I think, are in the class with Denny in the afternoon, the database class, when you do a select statement. All right, it gives you data, but you can't change the data with a select statement. That's a get, that's an accessor. If you want to change the data, you've got to use an insert or an update or a delete. All right, that's, that's using a set. So gets, access, sets actually change or mutate the data. So right now as we start, we'll have two pieces of data, a length and a width, and we'll have a couple methods to start with, a set length and a set width. Uh, and then we'll have some more up on the top of the next page. A get length, a get width, and what's called a get area. Now, the author's going to show you something here, and it's not really that important. You know, it's not like you should commit this to memory, but there is a chance that if you go in and you apply for a job that's more programming than it is web, you will be asked, do you know anything about UML, which stands for Unified Modeling Language? So you can probably say, mm, I don't know a damn thing about it. But you, you know, don't typically want to say that when you're interviewing, all right? Because the place you're interviewing at may use UML. UML is, it, is it's a diagrammatic type of language. So what it says is, if you start to create this class that's going to be called rectangle with these two pieces of data, length and width, with these two methods, set length and set width, and these three methods, get length, get width, and get area, you can show that pictorially like this. This is a UML diagram. It's split into thirds. The top third has the name. It has the name of the class. The middle third has the, the, the data that the class has. And the bottom third has the methods that work with the class. What you'll see as we go on in the chapter is this is about as simple as it gets. Typically, there's a lot more in a UML diagram than what you see right here. But I just want you to at least know that UML is Unified Modeling Language. It's a way of expressing all right, and showing classes and, as you go on, relationships between classes in a pictorial type of way as opposed to just doing it in code. Some people can look at pictures like this and it makes a lot more sense to them than it does to just see code after code after code, you know, type of thing. All right, so we're going to start writing this class, public class rectangle. Okay, so if we say here public class rectangle, what do we have to save this, this uh, file as? What's the name of it have to be? Rectangle.java with a capital R. What you're going to notice when we get done with this class, though, there will not be a main in it. We will write an, an entire new program that we'll call something like Rectangle Driver. That will have main in it. And Rectangle Driver will create an instance of our Rectangle class. All right? So public class Rectangle. Again, public just basically means that that class is accessible and it can be called not only from your program, but from any program that you come in contact with. All right. So then typically afterwards, what you put in there next are the names of your data. And you'll notice that while class names are typically public, and most method names, which you're going to see in a minute, are public, data is almost always private meaning that the only place that you can change that data is inside of this class. You, you, you control the data via the methods that are in the class. All right. So we've got a double for length and a double for width. 
You could raise your hand and say, well, it's, if it's height and width, why didn't they just make them, you know, why, why didn't they just turn around and just make them ints? You really could have. But if for some reason you want to use 7.8 for the length and 9.3 for the width, you can now do that. All right? All right. So you've looked at or you've heard a couple of these things before, but if you look, this is the table that's on the bottom of the page here, table 6-1, and it's explaining the difference between private and public. In a nutshell, in a nutshell, and I, I'm being general here, but it's pretty much, pretty much always holds true. What object-oriented programming consists of is you creating classes that use public methods, all right, to work with private data. That's almost all that it is. It is possible for you to have public data, but you never should. It is possible for you to have private methods. When you have private methods, they're typically called helper methods. There are things that work in the background that you don't, you know, other people don't have to know about. All right, so that was kind of quick, but just so you hear that. Then, writing a method called set length. All right, so this is what they're starting to do here. They're starting to build the class. As you can see here on page 329, figure 6-2. They're starting to build the class. And they're saying the class is public. Again, rectangle, rectangle. It's got two private data members, length and width. And right now, it also is going to have one public method. And this may look a little bit goofy to you. All right? But what this is saying is, if I call set length, I'm going to pass a value into set length that is a double. Inside of here, that double, that, that value will be referred to as length. And I'm going to take that length and I'm going to set that equal, set the length equal to that. That length right here is that length right there. If you understand that, you're already on your way to understanding how this stuff works. All right? Now, I just want to mention something to you because a little later, we're going to go and we're going to do this ourselves. But magically, what's going to happen for you is these, the, what are called these getters and setters. By you clicking a button and eclipse, they're all going to be created for you automatically. All right? But I want, to, I want to quickly grab this, and I want to copy it to the clipboard. And, of course, give me an arrow. Yeah, I know if I do it enough times, you'll work. Come on. I'm going to try to cut this in half. There we go. So you can see what's going on here. This particular method that you see right there, this thing that says public, that one. You know, let me copy that. Thank you. All right. Oops. That method that you see right there, and I'll try to keep it in blue, that if I bring that up here, I'm going to put the same method in here and just get rid of the line numbers. And I want to show you this because quite often, the way people write this is not what's shown here, all right? They literally write here the word length, all right? But the problem is if I do this, that's not going to work right. Because if I do that and take a look at what's up here, all right? So this says I want to call a thing that's called set length, and I want to pass in something that's called length, and I want to take that length, and I want to set it equal to this length right here. But if you do it like that, the system is really confused and it doesn't know what to do. Literally what it does is it takes whatever you copied in and it copies it to itself. And it doesn't give you any error message. So what if I want to do this? What, what if I do want to use the word length here and I want it here? Then the one right here, I have to say that. So when I say this dot, that basically means I'm talking about the length that's right here, all right? You just learned your first thing about working with object orientation, and that is that it's very simple to confuse the system. So you either have to do something like this, or you have to do something like this. Even with what we have down here that you see in blue, if I wanted to, I still could have put there this dot length equal length. 
that still would have been okay. In fact, what a lot of what a lot of programmers do is they always put this dot in there, even if the, the parameter name is not the same. All right, but I just wanted you to see that because he talks about it, but not right away. You're going to see a lot of a lot of code that's out there that's written like this here. Okay. All right. Now, when we look at this, what does this all mean? Well, this shows you right here. What you see right there, this shows you how a setter is used. And what I mean by that is a setter, all right, has something passed in but doesn't return anything. Do you all hear that? That's the most important thing almost always about a setter. Has something passed in, returns nothing. All right? Almost always with a getter, it has nothing passed in, so there'll be nothing in here, but it will return something. Because you're getting it. Here you're setting it. Later, what you'll see is we'll be getting it. All right? So the author does a really nice job here of explaining everything that's happening in every part of this particular method. I went over it with you, but if you need more, take a look at what he talks about on 329. And he shows you on 330. Because he's showing you, basically, the header for the method right there. Public meaning it can be called from that class or from other classes. Void meaning it doesn't return anything. Set length, which is its name. Double len, which means that a double must be passed in, that inside of the method it will be referred to as len. All right, so what the author says then is now we've got this, we've created this class. It's real simple. We're not done with it yet, but it's called rectangle. Now we're going to create another class that's called length demo. That's where we have our main in a separate class. And then if you look on the next page here, 331, there's where we're creating a new rectangle object. All right. So we're creating a brand new rectangle object. So that's going out, and it's now going to make anything that's in that rectangle.java class accessible to this particular Java file. So notice it can call set length. All right, because set length was declared in rectangle.java. But since we just made a new rectangle object, we can now use the stuff that's in rectangle.java. I would tell you that if you've managed to skate by this semester and not read the book, that it gets harder after this. I would strongly suggest that you do read the chapter. So he explains down on the bottom of the page here exactly what's happening. And he says there's two things that are happening right there. When you say rectangle box, I mean, again, imagine that we did this, that we said int age equal 21, all right? That's kind of like this, except remember when we did this, I said, what are we doing right there? We're declaring a variable. What are we doing right here? Rectangle box. We're declaring a variable. It's called box. It's of type rectangle. But in the past, when we've initialized a simple variable, We've said equal followed by a simple value. But now, when we're working with an object, it's name of the class, variable equals new, followed by the class name, then you may or may not have something in those parentheses, as you'll see as we go on in here. And again, the author mentions, says, recall that a variable of a class type holds the memory address. So what box holds is the address of where the stuff lives in memory. So they're right there. All right, that's the address. That's box. All right. And you may or may not know this or care or realize it, but you've been doing the same kind of thing in C Sharp. Because like Java, C Sharp is also an object-oriented programming language. 
but in there you're just used to dragging stuff out onto the form, etc. But every time you're doing that, the form is an object. It's part of the form class. Every time you create a button, it's a button object, which is part of the button class, etc. So you have been working with an object-oriented language, really two of them all semester. All right, again, he keeps going on here. So he says, not only will we have a set length, we will have a set width. All right, now once we do that, now we're able to call set width just like we called set length before. Those are setters. Those are when we're able to physically go in and change the value of something. Next, he talks about getters, which again are called accessors. Getters almost always have nothing passed into them, but virtually always return something. All right? Again, I gave you that example before. It's the first day of class in fall. Roger's the first guy in here. He says, how you doing? Are you Jeff? He you know, wants to make sure he's in the right class. I said, yeah, and what's your name? And he says, Roger. All right, I'm not setting anything. Neither is he. We're getting information. That's like two calls to get name. He gave one, I gave one. All right, yes. And how do you know if it's a double then? How do you know that it's a double? When you, when you're using Be a because this, this value that you see right there, that length, that is actually that value that's right there, that you've already defined as being a double. Oh, so you have to have the setter before you can make a getter. You, you either have to have a setter or you have to at least have declared that up, up here. All right? But it's the same kind of thing. Now, Damien asked me the question this morning. He said he was working with his uh, uh, rock, paper, scissors program. And he said that if it asked him, you know, to enter a one to three, and if you put X in there, for example, it blew up. All right. Same thing will happen here. If I create a brand new rectangle object, as you see, we're going to pass stuff in eventually, and it's going to expect two doubles to be passed in. But if I pass in hello and goodbye, it's going to blow up because it's expecting doubles and I'm giving it strings. All right. So until we get to chapter 11 in here, it's going to be really easy to blow these programs out of the water. So there's our setters, and there's our getters. So now we can come in here and we can call set length and we can call get length. And notice in here, especially in the stuff that's in blue here, what are we doing? We're calling a method from within a method. We are inside of the system.out.println method. Rather than us having to worry about the value of, of the length of the box, we can call get length, which will return that length to us. Same thing with width. And you can see what we get, the length and the width. Now, the next one that's in here is probably the hardest. All right, because notice what they're doing here. This is get area. It's a double, there's nothing passed in, but you're returning length times width. That sounds like, wait a minute, shouldn't that be, shouldn't that be a setter? Shouldn't there be a set area? And technically, you could. What this is doing is it's making sure every time you call get area, it has the most up-to-date length and it has the most up-to-date width. All right, so even though you could have made this a set area and a get area, it's typically not done like that. And the author even mentions in here, you typically do it like this so you can avoid having what's called stale data. All right, data that could possibly have been changed since the last time you called it. And actually, when you look at this, return length times width, all right, what they really could have done right here, sometimes, whoops, sometimes you even see it like this, but just to show you this, what you could have done is instead of saying this, re return length times width, which is totally okay, you could have also said return uh, the name box dot get length. times box dot get with. That actually does the same thing. Okay, you could have done it like that also. 
So the author is saying right here, if you set the length to 10, you set the width to 20, and you call get area, that sure as heck better return 200. And that's the next example. So he's building this thing very piecemeal in here. And there's what you get. All right. So next he talks about accessors and mutators. I'm not going to go into them because I already have. Again, accessors are getters. Mutators are setters. What's really nice, and you don't have to use this, but what I'm going to show you after the break is even if we have five pieces of data, for example. So let's say we wanted five setters and five getters. We can write them ourselves. Or we can literally just tell Eclipse, create all the setters and getters for us. Boom, it creates 10 methods for you. Five setters and five getters. So next they talk a little bit about data hiding, and look at it this way, okay? If you haven't heard these words before, then it's a problem either from me or from a previous instructor or whatever. But interface and implementation, okay? As an example, all right? Right now I'm using Notepad, just simple Notepad right here. The interface is me typing in the words interface and implementation. That's the interface that you can see on the screen. The implementation is literally what's happening when I strike the letter I. What causes that I to appear here? So the idea, and what, what, the reason I'm trying to tell you this, is quite often in your life, you don't know how something works, nor do you care. You just care about the interface. That's what's made available to you. You don't particularly care about the implementation. All right. Tomorrow, and, and I live in Rockton, so we still have one of the old time voting things where they literally give us a piece of paper and they give us a black magic marker and have it put, put that in there. All right, I don't know why, but that's the way they do it. But I voted in other places where they've got the levers and everything else in there. Maybe that's what you do. And I don't know about you, but but whether they do that or whether after I give the piece of paper and they whip it in the machine and whatever, I don't know how that's actually implemented so that my vote is going to count towards somebody, and I don't care. I just care that the interface is written in such a way that I understand what it is I'm supposed to do. All right, And quite often, I think about this, you've used, for example, system.out.println. You all know what it means. And I don't know about you, but I don't know internally what happens when you do that. I don't care. I just care that with, it shows me the interface, and if I do it like this, it should work. All right. So they're talking about data hiding in there. Basically, what you want to do as a developer all right, is you want to hide your data. That's why it's all private. Because then only you are able to go in there and manipulate that data all right, with those methods that you've set up for it. If you made it public, then anyone could go in and manipulate it. You don't want that. All right, so now they're coming in here and they're going back to that UML diagram and they're making it a little bit more complex. Keep it simple. Minus means private, plus means public. That makes sense when you take a look at it. That's the only change that you've seen in here from what was in there previously. Okay? And it is possible to have methods in here that have a minus sign. All right, you should really never have data that has a plus sign. So now they're also showing. So notice the data, minus length, colon, and then the data type. All right. So this says we've got two pieces of data, a private variable, a double private that's called length, a double private that's called width. We also have five different methods. All right. Two of the methods return nothing because you can see void right there. Three of the methods return a double. Those three methods that return a double, nothing is passed into them. Those two methods that return nothing each have a double passed into them. And if you understand that, there isn't any more to it than that. Again, it is a visual interpretation of the code that you can use to write a class. So again, you might say, well, why are you making this big a thing out of it? Because there are tools that you can buy that will either take your UML diagrams and write code for you, 
or we'll take your code and create UML diagrams from it. All right? But if you work at a place that doesn't have the money for those tools, you'll do both. All right, as I mentioned to you before, typically what you do in here is when you create your class, you put your data first, then you put your methods afterward. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. All right. Okay, instance fields and methods. So if I, earlier when I started this, I said let's talk about having a class that's called person. And I said a person would have a height, they'd have a weight, they'd have a, a gender, etc. I think you'd all agree that if I looked at everybody in this room, it's, it's conceivable that you each could have a different height and a different weight. It's possible. It's possible we've got two people in here that are the same height and the same width, or the same weight rather, but probably not. All right? The gender, well, we only have two possibilities that I know of at least. All right? But the point is, each time we create an object, each object would have their own height, their own weight, and their own gender. When you do that, that's called instance fields. So each instance or each object has its own. Just like each time I create a rectangle, they only created one rectangle in here, but I could create a hundred of them if I wanted to. And each rectangle could have its own height, could have, it, it could have its own uh, width, and its own length, I should say. So each one could conceivably have its own area that no two would be the same. That would be possible. And that's what they're talking about in here. Now what we'll get into, I don't think it's in this chapter, <clears throat> but it's also possible for you to write certain things. Remember that word static? Yeah. If you use that word static, that means that each, that each one doesn't have their own. You have one and it's shared. So again, if I was making a variable that was called person counter, and I was going to make one for each one of you in here. You know, I wanted one person counter that had a value of, let's say there's 15 of you in here. I'd make that static. Because if I didn't, I'd have 15 different counters. Each one would have a value of one. That wouldn't make a lot of sense. We're going to go over this, then we're going to take a break. When you create a brand new object, a special function is automatically called. That's called a constructor. It's automatically called. You go, uh, wait a minute, what if I didn't write one? Then it, calls a, then it calls a constructor with nothing in it. But a constructor is always called. You'll see this more after we have the break and we go through this example. All right? And hopefully it'll make sense when you do that. But if you look right here, this looks a little bit different. Take a look right here. You may or may not notice it, but if I asked you what's, what's funky about that method in line 16, there's two things that are funky about it. Number one, it's got the same name as my class. And number two, it is not legal for you to put a return type in a constructor. It cannot have a return type, not even void. You put any return type in there, you get an error. All right. In English, what this is saying is, now I'm going to have the ability that when I create a new rectangle, I'm going to have to pass it in a length and a width. And that length that I pass in when I create it is going to be copied over to this, and that width that I pass it in when I create it is going to be copied over to that. All right. So this right here, what you see on lines 16 through 20, that's a constructor that has two parameters. So what if I create a constructor now? I can create another one, what's called overloading my constructor. I can create another constructor that maybe doesn't require any parameters. So it can say public rectangle paren, paren, all right? Then I can give whatever value, default value, I want to give to length and width. I could say length equals zero, width equals zero. Boom, I can do that, all right? So again, they mention here, this constructor accepts two arguments. 
Again, the constructor does not specify a return type, cannot specify a return type. So now, when we create a new rectangle, since we only have the one constructor, we must pass it in two doubles. You must. If you tried saying right there, rectangle box equal new rectangle paren paren, just like that, you'd get an error message because it would be looking for a constructor that had no arguments and it wouldn't find one. Well, what if I want one? Then I can do what's called overload my constructor. All right. So notice in here what they've added now. What they just added was this right here. That first line that you see, all right, and that's the constructor. All right. If you do this, if you did that in your code, if you wrote rectangle box, then in the next line, right underneath that, you wrote down system.out.println, and you put box in the parentheses. What do you think would happen? Well, Roger said, boom, I guess that's the right idea. The program would blow up. You'd get what's called a null pointer reference. Because right now, this doesn't have any value in it or to it. So if you tried to print it out before it had a value, all right, it wouldn't work. But what the author's saying here is it is legal for you to put a line in here like this and then initialize it down below. You can do that. You know now already, because we've worked with input dialogues and message dialogues, you could come up here and you could create this. And then you could ask the user, what length would you like for your rectangle? What width would you want for your rectangle? Then after you pass those values, you know, you have the user put in those values, then you could do something like this. Again, those don't have to be numbers. Those can be variables. So, so far we haven't put our own constructor in until you just saw this. So what happens? What happens when you do this if you don't have a constructor? It calls a constructor. That one right there, if you do this, it calls what's known as the default constructor, which simply looks like this. Public, rectangle, paren, paren, curly brace, curly brace. That's it. Doesn't do anything. But it has to have a constructor to call. So if you don't create one, one gets created for you. I just want you to understand that. All right. You can write your own constructor with nothing in it and make it do whatever you want it to do. All right, I talked before about setting them both equal to zero. Well, the author didn't like that, so he sets them both equal to one. That's fine. All right. And I'll do, we'll, go, we'll look at this and then we'll take a break. I want you to understand this line right here that you see in gray, string name equal Joe Mahoney. When you write that, it's a shortcut. Literally what the system does when you write this is it does this. Strings are used so often in this language that there is a shortcut for them. This is about the only kind of object variable for which there is a shortcut. So again, you do this, but the system does this. And the author even says there, it's because they're a special case in Java. Since they're used so often, there's shortcuts that are written. All right? The author gives you this cell phone class thing. If you can get anything out of that, cool. All right. Let's take a break. It's 10.51. Let's come back at 5 after. We'll pick it up here on section 6.5, Passing Objects as Arguments.